here valley. And so um, Alex will tell us about tracing the twilight years of uh, massive stars. We'll start with Morgan. Hi, thank you for, uh, for having me. For those of you who are at the colloquium, that's going to be pretty much of a repeat, but a little bit shorter. Um, <laughs> so, 15 minutes, right? And then, okay. Uh, all right, so in the recent years, so I'm a cosmologist, I, I work on inflation during my PhD. But then when I started my postdoc at MIT, I, I wanted to, um, to try to make use of the fact that now we can actually detect gravitational waves and try to see what uh, kind of cosmological information we can get uh, from it. Uh, okay, so again, this is something that I think most of you are familiar with. Now we can actually not only look at the universe, we can also hear the universe. We can detect gravitational waves uh, of, of many frequency range. Um, we have beautiful interferometer like LIGO and Virgo. We're gonna have space interferometer like LISA but I'm more interested in the low frequency range of the gravitational waves. Uh, those are mainly detected by PTAs, pulsar timing arrays. Those use pulsars as astrophysical equivalent of atomic clock. When a gravitational waves go through pulsars, it's going to change the very cyclical uh, signal that they emit, uh, indicating the presence of a gravitational waves. And the reason I find it interesting is because hopefully we can actually one day get a stochastic gravitational wave background of cosmological nature. So far, it seems that Nanograph has detected a stochastic gravitational wave background last June of astrophysical nature, mainly made of uh, binary black hole mergers. But the question I'm asking is, what if one day, hopefully soon, we are able to get a cosmological uh, stochastic gravitational wave background. Um, so again, I know this is a long way, um, but I think it's still worth investigating. It took 50 years to go from the idea of the CMB to the actual CMB. And now we all know and love this beautiful picture of Planck uh, that gave us an enormous amount of information um, and, and clues about the, the universe. So I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a young physicist, and so uh, 50 years is a long time, but hopefully I'll, I'll still be here. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the, the question is, what if we're able to get the gravitational equivalent of, of the CMB? Um, so what do we measure when we look at the stochastic gravitational wave background? We measure this omega here parameter, which is basically the ratio between the density of gravitational waves to the critical density in uh, frequency. And what is interesting here is that this can be connected to the occupation number of, uh, of graviton. And when I talk about graviton, uh, I'm just saying, I'm not claiming that we have discovered graviton, I'm just claiming that at low enough energy gravity can be described as a um, theory of a massless spin to particle, hence graviton. Um, okay, so what sources are we interested in when we talk about a cosmological gravitational wave background? Uh, obviously, um, the, the, the gravitational wave coming from inflation, phase transition, topological defect, cosmic string, etc., etc. I'm mainly going to focus on inflation. Even looking at inflation, it is not so easy because we need to try to figure out the right uh, theory of inflation. And we all know now that um, there is uh, not only multiple of them, but there is also uh, a discussion about whether it's single field or multi field. It is multi field. Um, but so we have to figure out a way to, to understand the sources of those gravitational waves. We also have to be able to understand the astrophysical contaminations, which here are considered contaminations. They don't always have to be contaminations. Um, this could be. Um, Obviously, uh, binary black hole mergers, white dwarf mergers, uh, supermassive black holes. But I think we're starting to understand them better and better. And so that gives hope that in a couple of years, we could be able to actually get the cosmological stochastic gravitational wave uh, background. So again, the question I'm asking is, if one day we're able to get the cosmological equivalent of the CMB, what kind of physics can we do? What kind of information can we get from it? So this is not the cosmological gravitational wave background. This is actually made out of uh, white dwarf binary mergers. Um, OK, and as I mentioned, we can actually connect the detection of a stochastic gravitational wave background to the occupation number of graviton. 
And this is interesting because it resonates a little bit with, or a lot, with the SZ effect, the sunyaev zaldovich effect, which looked at the distortion or the, the, the shift in intensity um, of, I mean, the shift in the intensity spectrum of the CMB. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, photons emitted by the CMB going to interact with electron in the intragalactic medium. Um, because of that interaction, there is a, a shift. They're getting energy through those uh, energized or, or energetic uh, electron, and that actually uh, creates a shift. And this is very interesting because this gave astrophysicists um, information about the intragalactic uh, medium. I'm sure you, some of you know more about it than me. Um, so here, what are we really looking at? Uh, it's Sunyaev, Zeldovich, companions all together during the Cold War. They had to, um, I think, keep it down low because, it was, again, I was saying it was also financed by the Russian equivalent of the H-bomb. But anyway, so it was the three of them. Um, <laughs> I learned that it was not only companion, but really uh, Sunyaev. So anyway, uh, those three amazing Russian physicists in a very difficult time, I'm sure, um, decided to use some of the H-bomb funding to do something very different. And here they looked at the relaxation of a photon bath to thermal equilibrium via Compton scattering with electrons. So here there's mainly two effects that come into play. There's a stimulated emission that only affects the occupation number of photons, meaning that the photons are going to change energy levels. And then there is the Compton scattering that uh, is going to change the occupation number of electrons and uh, photons through this Compton interaction. Um, so now this leads to this beautiful master equation where again, we have really all those components that we have. We have first of all the transition rates that has information about the differential Compton cross sections or the interactions between photons and electrons. Um, here we uh, can simplify um, this occupation number, this is the occupation number of photons and electrons, but electrons relax faster than the photons, so we can actually um, kind of decouple them and also use the fact that um, the electrons follow a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution in momentum. And here um, we also are going to do a simple Taylor expansion in, uh, in energy uh, to try to simplify and be able to calculate or solve that equation. So here is again the beautiful companion equation that again tells us the change of occupation number of photons and the information about uh, the processes um, are hiding here in the I1 and I2. One and two basically tells us the order of expansion that we're interested in. Again, the assumptions are that the electrons are in thermal equilibrium, photons are soft, electrons are not relativistic. So now why am I telling you about the SZ effect when I started talking about stochastic gravitational wave? So here the question is, can we do something similar, but instead of looking at photon-electron el interactions, we would be looking at graviton interacting with beyond the standard model particles, dark matter particles, who knows. Um, so here, one of the main problems that the community has today is trying to figure out the nature of dark matter. So this was, and I'm not uh, saying that we discovered, we don't know, but um, so there's a lot of really beautiful and creative ideas out there, but they, they don't seem to lead to anything. So the main three that we have, indirect detections, we're looking at gamma ray in the, in the, um, in the galaxy, trying to find the one that don't have sources and say, okay, this comes from, uh, interactions of annihilation of dark matter giving us gamma rays. We can basically try to produce dark matter in colliders at CERN, for example, or we can build, or we do build xenon detectors, hoping that WIMPs interacting with the nuclei of xenon will actually lead to scintillation, which would tell us we finally discovered dark matter. Um, but those all come with an assumption that um, dark matter has to somewhat couple with standard model. All we know is that dark matter couples with gravity. So here, how can we basically set up a gravitational equivalent of the SZ effect? So instead of looking at the cosmic microwave background, we would be looking at the gravitational equivalent of it. Instead of looking at photon-electron interactions, we would be looking at graviton interacting with beyond the standard model particles. And then we have to solve the gravitational equivalent of the companion's equations. So we did this, we realized there is a shift uh, similar to the, to the shift in intensity that we see for the 
as the effect, but when we look at beyond the standard model particles, spin zero, spin half, spin one, the shift is incredibly small. This is not going to be detectable. However, we wanted to look at the formalism because I think it is important to kind of have new creative ideas out there. And is it already off? Yeah. Oh my God. And it's a much bigger effect for primordial black holes. And um, so we have some issues. <laughs> I don't really know what to say. We have some issues, but for primordial black holes, we looked at asteroid ma mass range, and we actually realized that there is a 0.3% distortion, and with enhancement, meaning that when we look at one graviton interacting with a lot of primordial black holes, we go all the way to a 5% spectral distortions. And I'm not completely done. Um, I just want to emphasize that uh, with some colleagues at MIT, we're trying to come up with a workshop where we will go to different countries in Africa to try to talk to scientists there, which has never been done and is very important because tomorrow the population will be in Africa. Most of the young people in 2050 uh, under 35 will be in Africa, but Africa is completely absent from the physics map. Here again, research output per 1 million population. In North America, we have 22.31. In Africa, we have 0.21. As an MLK scholar, it is important that we try to bridge uh, the gap and we try to go and reach out to our colleagues in Africa to inspire the younger generations to do more physics. All right, thank you. I'd love to learn about it. I mean, I'm really on the theory, theory part of it, but if there's already some astronomy there, I think yeah, it would be great. So the SK, uh, 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 low would be there, right? Um, and so, uh, but just, uh, I just wanted to mention about the Komponitz equation, the history. So actually, it was important for the atomic uh, project in, in, in both Russia and Manhattan project because it, you can say it, we have a few more minutes. Uh, because it, um, uh, it was important to calculate the uh, interaction of the radiation in the fireball of the explosion with, with the matter. So okay. that's, how, that's why they developed it. It was classified in Russia at the time, and Zeldovich was the head of the group that was doing the calculations. And Kompanitz was a member of the group, and he somehow came out with a publication like 10 years later, and Zendovich was not happy about it because he actually was responsible for deriving it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, I heard the story from Rashid Sunyai, who was a yeah. student of Zendovich in the late 60s. All of that happened a decade before Sunyai was a student of Zendovich. So then Zendovich wow. said, okay, well, he published it, now we will use it for astrophysics in the context of the microwave vacuum, because the microwave vacuum was discovered in 63 right. or so. Um, and so that, that's the history of the companies leaking the results of the group of Zedovic okay. and yeah. then Zedovic with his student, Sunyai, using that uh, equation that Zedovic already knew because he derived it for astrophysics. But it's not the companies. So all of those papers, basically, the, the, the results uh, happened 10 years prior to Yeah, because wow. it, and it was classified as yeah. part of the atomic uh, right. project. Yeah, just like. I mean, the U.S. also, the Manhattan Project was classified, but right. there was actually a spy that leaked the information to the Soviets. To the Soviets, yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, you can stay because maybe there are questions. Uh, oh. Any, any okay. questions to Morgan? Yes, please. I'd be a really naive question. You're talking about how gravitons might interact with beyond the standard model particles. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about could they interact with electrons as well, just like photons do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's true. They could. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you also have to. So you also have to look into the optical depth of the particular interaction that you're looking at. So you have to make sure that you have enough interactions. But they would interact with anything. And again, when I say graviton, I'm not claiming. Uh, I was mentioning that earlier. I'm not claiming that graviton exists. I'm just saying that at low enough energy, gravity can be described as a theory of graviton. So it's just uh, effectively speaking, we can describe it as, as an interaction between graviton and other particles. Any other questions? Uh, if not, oh, yeah, go ahead. So following up on that, then then if you get this uh, cosmic gravitational wave background and the gravity background, would that tell you anything about a possible theory for quantum gravity? Um, no, I don't think so. No, no, because again, we're, we're early at low energy. It's, it's, so it's not going to give us any information about 
are converted. Yeah. So, so the waves we're detecting in astrophysics are in the classical physics regime. They are, you know, the occupation number of gravitons is high. Just like an electromagnetic wave, according to Maxwell's equations, is a, you know, is classical, but it's a, just a collection of a lot of photons, and the same is true about astrophysical gravitational waves. But there is a fundamental question as to whether we can detect individual gravitons. And Freeman Dyson wrote a paper about how difficult it might be, and other people debated it in recent years. So that's a subject for the future. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so All much. Right. Thank Emma. you. Can you hear me properly? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Hope still. So. Okay, perfect. Hello everyone, my name is Ralf Konietzka. I'm a PhD student here at the Center for Astrophysics, and today I'm gonna to talk about our waving galactic backyard, or in other words, the oscillation of the Radcliffe wave. But before I go into the details, let us have a look where we are actually located. This is a cartoon view of our Milky Way galaxy, as we know it today. So you see Sagittarius A star in the center embedded in the galactic bar and bulge. You see the galactic disk with some spiral structure and fading at the edges. Everything is embedded in a gigantic dark halo and our little sun is located eight kiloparsecs away from the center of our galaxy. And if we zoom into the, into the region of the solar system, we can ask the question, how does the neighborhood of our home look like on a galactic scale? How does the interstellar medium look like in 3D? And thanks to the wonderful technique called free dust mapping, which was pioneered here at Harvard by Doug Finkbein and Catherine Sacker, we now know how the interstellar medium looks like in 3D. And I'm showing you here a top-down view from, from one of these 3D dust maps. This one is from Berkeley et al. in 2022, and you see different structures appearing directly next to the solar system. Most importantly, there is this one overdensity, which I'm highlighting in red, and this is the so-called Radcliffe wave from a top-down view. And now you were asked, hey, what is he talking about? There is no wave at all. This is a top-down view on the local neighborhood of the solar system. If we change our perspective to the side, we are going to see how the wave is undulating through the galactic disk. And this was discovered in 2022 by Joao Alves, Catherine Sacker, and Alyssa Goodman, and showed that the Radcliffe wave has an amplitude of roughly 200 parsecs above and below the galactic plane with a wavelength of two kiloparsecs. And the structure, this is the same image I showed you previously, top down in the galactic plane. And here we show now from the Radcliffe wave to the side or end on. And we see how this three times 10 to the six solar mass structure is undulating through the plane. But in 2022, we didn't know, is the structure just standing still? Or is it even oscillating? And if it's oscillating, is it waving like a traveling wave or like a standing wave? Are the star-forming regions along the Red Cliff wave randomly moving upwards, or is there a current pattern? And to answer this question, let us go back to the cartoon view and see what we already know. We see next to the solar system, there's this gigantic kiloparsec long structure called the Red Cliff wave. And this was observed in dust. So we can now use, in principle, gas velocities to obtain radio velocity measurements of the structure to see how it's moving. The problem with the gas, however, is that we only get one extra dimension. So we can't really tell how the structure is moving in 3D. We can use the, the gas to evaluate our method, but to really properly know how the wave is moving, we should rather use young stars which were just formed in this gigantic structure. So within the molecular clouds along the Redcliffe wave, which I have shown you in red on the previous slide, we now will be looking at little baby stars which were just born in this structure. And with baby, I mean stars with an age younger than 15 to 30 million years. So they are pretty old compared to us. And with the stars in hand, we now have a proxy of the mother clouds motion, which we can use to determine the motion of the entire structure. And now going away from the cartoon back to the data, what we're seeing here using now stellar clusters to average out the single motions of the little stars in the birth clouds, we see 
how the red cliff wave again in the top down view appears like it has this straight structure and in the side view. And it's important to know that in this figure, we only made a cut to our data set in the top down view, not in the side view. So here, there are no star measurements because there are no molecular clouds where no stars can form. So in other words, our idea as using the star clusters as proxies for the cloud velocities should be using already this example, should be a valid approach. And having now the cluster measurements, as I already said, we can now use them, especially thanks to the latest Gaia release, Gaia DR3, which gave us lots more information about the radial velocity component together with precise proper motions to determine how the structure is moving. And now I turn this view, so the upper panel here is the same picture as you saw previously, but now in 3D, X, Y, Z galactic Cartesian coordinates, while in this plot the lower panel shows you the velocity counterpart vertically with respect to the Radcliffe wave. So the plane is the same, again, X and Y galactic Cartesian coordinates, but the z-axis shows you the vertical velocity component. And you see in both figures that we see not only in the spatial part, this undulation, but also in the kinematic view. And the important thing now, all the clusters themselves are moving up and down, as we know by galactic dynamics, but the entire three kiloparsec structure shows a phase offset between the spatial and the kinematic part by around 90 degrees. And this means that the Radcliffe wave is traveling through our neighborhood like a traveling wave not like a standing wave. And you can think of this entire phenomenon as you would be in a stadium where fans are jumping up and sitting down again, as you can see here, to create a moving or a stadium wave through the arena. And the same is happening in the neighborhood of our solar system, but here it's the baby stars which are jumping up and falling down again. And the jumping and the falling is mediated, or the force which drives the oscillation is dominated or consistent with the galactic potential. And this is wonderful because we can now reverse our setup to use the Radcliffe wave to determine local properties of the galactic potential. In other words, the spatial and the kinematic view are combined by the oscillation frequency of the wave, and we can measure that to determine the period the sun needs to oscillate through the galactic plane, as shown here. And we find consistent with previous approaches to measure local properties of the galactic potential that the solar oscillation period should be around 90 million years. And the same holds for the oscillation period of the Radcliffe wave. And now, some of you may wonder, wait a minute, molecular clouds should have a lifetime of 30 to 50 million years. And there might be also additional effects like fake mixing which might destroy the structure. And therefore, instead of showing the oscillation going on and on, we should fade out the data after around 30 to 50 million years to indicate that the Radcliffe wave won't be observable in around 30 million years anymore because the clouds might be destroyed and the stars might face mix out. Mm -hmm. But today, even though not on our life scales, the structure is oscillating like a traveling wave. And we can use the figure, turn it around, and find even more. The wave is not only vertically oscillating, it's also drifting away from us indicated by the green and by the purple arrow here on the side. If we play the figure, we see this five kilometers per second drift, which is happening in a co-rotating frame. So the Radcliffe wave is rotating along the galactic center while drifting away from us. And this we can already see in recent simulations of the Milky Way, where we see such structures drifting away from us. This is a simulation by Sarah Jefferson from 2021. And we see filaments drifting away from us, similar as what we observe now in the neighborhood of the solar system. And this might give us a hint how the Radcliffe wave might have formed in the first place. It might be that internal galactic effects driven by feedback push the gas out of the plane. But as of now, not really properly in any simulations, a Radcliffe wave like analog was found. So stay tuned on what we will learn about how the wave formed. But I promised you in the beginning that I will also look at the gas velocities to evaluate our method. So in other words, let us have now a look on only the gas component of the wave. So I will turn off the clusters, and we only show along the, me uh, the molecular clouds along the structure. And we're using 12CO here as a proxy for the radial velocity. And when we look at these yellow lines, we see the red cliff wave, given its huge length of 3 kiloparsecs, and that it's so close to the sun, only 300 parsecs away from many, many different angles. 
So even though we have just one dimension in radial velocities, we can use our six-dimensional fit using the cluster data, project it down to the four-dimensional radial velocity gas and dust space to compare both and see if our cluster fit is consistent, but we learn from the gas measurement, which we get from our line of sight velocity approach. And if we do that, we see here, this is the spectrum, so we look at the position along the wave, along the structure, and we measure the radial velocity component, and the black line is the best fit I showed you where the wave was oscillating properly. And if you project it down to this four-dimensional space, we see it fits the observations we get from the dust. So in other words, all three parts, the dust, the gas, and the stars together form a coherent picture of the oscillating and traveling wave next to our solar system, which is also drifting away from us with around five kilometers per second. And now let me use my phone, and I hope this works now. So this is a normal iPhone, and I will be sharing my screen. Calling the wave? I'm calling the wave, but it's, <laughs> it's not working, so we go for plan B. <laughs> Yesterday it worked. <laughs> but I opened a Zoom call in the background, so I will use the Zoom call with myself to share the screen. Ah, there you go. And then we are going to Safari. And with a normal phone, you can open this figure and then project the Radcliffe wave in the middle of the Philips Auditorium and see how it oscillates next to the solar system from different angles while we are seeing all of you in the background. <laughs> and with that, I go back to my slides. <laughs> and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. The restoring force on the motion yeah. is coming from the surface mass density of the disk. Yeah. And so that's another way of inferring the Oort limit, which is measuring. Exactly. I mean, usually it's done based on the epicyclic frequency and so forth. Can you say something new about how much dark matter we have in our vicinity? <laughs> we have not much dark matter in our vicinity, especially the proposed idea that there is a dark disk next to the solar system can be ruled out as or similar to the odd limits approach using the red cliff wave. So you should tell that to Lisa Rand. Oh, you well, do you have the extra graph with the dinosaur? I don't have it in this slide. Oh. Okay, so you... So just to clarify, you, you ruled out what she was proposing? Um, we find very strong evidence that it's unlikely that the dark <laughs> 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 The referee made why why did the referee made you take it down? Because it also was then the, the entire story is that the dinosaurs might be killed about the dark disk, so it's a super um, gloomy picture. And it's also a bit away from the main result of the paper that the wave is oscillating and drifting away from us. But the, the calculations of how much dark matter in the form of a disk is um, can still be found in the paper. Just the conclusions are not that. Okay, sure. Well we know it now. <laughs> <laughs> So, Ralph, this is beautiful stuff. So, if I understand, you look at the phase offset between the displacement and, uh, I'm not sure, there are two things that you were trying to come, the velocity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, velocity and displacement. And from that, you conclude that it's not a standing wave, but it's a traveling yeah. wave, right? And in the combination of both, we implement the current knowledge of the galactic potential at the first place. Okay. And then we reverse the setup in leaving what we know about the oscillation frequency as a free parameter. So it's basically two different approaches. Good. But this means you also know the direction in which it's moving, right? Yeah. So, I mean, was this wave created by something in its past? Can you go back and say, ah, that was what made this guy start in the yeah. first, first place? So this is a, these are two really, really important points, and it's a great question. Um, 
the motion itself we are seeing is as in the stadium, more visually. So the fans, they are standing at their place, just the wave is traveling. And if, a, if something might create the wave here, and this is a challenging question, because if the creation came from the right side and would travel to the left side, why is the damping of the wave reversed? <laughs> and that's, that's a, you can in principle explain the traveling wave nature <laughs> with the um, right damping if you have a super massive black hole crossing through the disk, which is super crazy massive. Um, what, what about the dwarf galaxy? A dwarf galaxy would be too fast. Too fast. For what we are not, if there's a dwarf galaxy we, which we haven't observed, which is very massive, so up to the 10 to the, a little bit more than 10 to the 9 solar masses, which I don't think we would have missed, that would be possible. But for the current dwarf galaxies, they're crossing, for, for example, the Sagittarius crossing would be too fast to produce wavelengths on this small scale. Uh, can you tell us how far the wave propagates the way you're showing in this beautiful figure. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to be traveling around. This is, what we, it? I mean, this is what we don't know, because our current so knowledge about the local... Is, sorry. is it possible with any other techniques to detect the wave at much larger distances? Yes, but we need a better data set. And, and they're 21 centimeters. 21 centimeters, too. But they're, have, you, have people been considering other ways that we could really extend this? So for 21 centimeters, the problem is you need the three-dimensional information about the clouds. If you only have a two-dimensional plot, or even with the kinematic velocities on top, you cannot distinguish if something is really oscillating with this comparable small amplitude of just two not parsecs. But the 3D dust measuring technique can be extended out of our current knowledge volume of two kiloparsecs if we have more precise data further away from the solar system. So in the next around five years, it should be possible to extend this map over a much bigger fraction of the galaxy to see if there are other waves, or if the wave extends even further. And the same might be possible to be done for external galaxies. Not with 3D dust measuring, but there to look, as we see it from face, on, on the velocity patterns and see if there are similar, wave, uh, similar wavelengths in the velocity pattern as well, even though we don't know their spatial undulation because we can't resolve on a 100 parsec scale for us. Yeah, just a quick thing. <coughs> that was great, Ralph. And so Ralph didn't show you one thing, which is like the most confusing thing I've seen, which is Catherine has a collaborator, Sarah Lohman, who has this simulation that forms something that isn't quite the right long wave, but it's kind of the right size and shape. <coughs> it's not like a structure that exists for hundreds of millions of years and then winds up where you see. It's little pieces of stuff from all over the galaxy that somehow come together to make this briefly. And then you don't know what happens to it because they don't run the simulation far enough afterwards. But the idea that there's like some thing that's, and by the way, this is the spine of the local arm of the galaxy. This is the one. So like the idea that that's some consistent pattern that just keeps going for 250 million years or whatever is wrong, um, according to the simulation. And so not only do we not know what caused the oscillation, we don't even know what caused the structure. So we shouldn't, even though this is a beautiful animation, we shouldn't get the idea that this is some long-lasting thing. Like Ralph said, the clusters themselves will last less than 30 million years, which is why we phase this out in less than one oscillation period, which is 90 million years. So it's very strange from the time evolution. So Ralph, we, we expect you to solve all of these problems. <laughs> <laughs> if you want a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's OK. <laughs> Let's thank uh, Ralph again.
Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Right, good. Cool. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Connor. I'm uh, a postdoc working with Ashley Villa. Um, and I'll be talking to you about the, uh, the pre-supernova life of Supernova 2023-IXF. 2023-IXF is uh, an object of great interest uh, due to it being so close um, in the pinwheel galaxy. Uh, Daiichi has given a talk fairly recently on the early life uh, of the actual supernova itself, and um, Ashley Villar at the colloquium this week gave a bit of a sneak peek into what we're talking about today. This work was done in collaboration with lots of lovely people at the Young Supernova Experiment, so uh, many thanks to them. There's far too many of them to list on this uh, title slide. So um, I'm, I want to start, allegedly. <laughs> I want to start by um, just having a quick overview as to what a supernova is. So when we talk about core collapse supernovae, we're talking about fairly massive stars uh, with an initial mass of over eight solar masses, uh, exhausts its fuel and explodes as a spectacular explosion that we, uh, that we see lots of nowadays. Um, supernovae can be classified in, uh, into a zoo and this zoo uh, holds a menagerie of many spectroscopic and photometric classes. Um, so broadly, we spectroscopically classify supernovae depending on whether there is hydrogen in their spectra. So a type one does not have hydrogen and a type two uh, does. And these can then be split into many, as many as you want really other classes based on photometric thing, things or other spectroscopic features. Um, so in terms of the proportions of different supernova classes that we see, so this is a chart from uh, the data release one of the Young Supernova Experiment uh, data release. Um, and we see that m m most observed supernovae are type 1a, so these are actually white dwarfs, uh, the explosions of white dwarfs. Um, but then the most common form of core collapse supernovae are the type 2s. Uh, and then... I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just talk about 23RXF a little bit, the actual discovery. So in May of last year, uh, a amateur astronomer, Koichi Takaki, um, discovered uh, 23RXF. So the, the, this particular uh, amateur astronomer actually discovers a lot of things. Uh, I'm stealing this uh, host image because it's much better than mine. Um, and yeah, th th this uh, 23XF is one of the closest supernovae in the past decade, and it is the closest uh, core collapse supernovae in the past decade. Um, and uh, the, the host actually has had four other supernovae observed since 1909, uh, with the last one being in 2011, uh, and that was a, another 1A. Um, and uh, Charlie Kilpatrick uh, and others found that the uh, the progenitor uh, from pre-explosion imaging was likely a very dusty red supergiant, which is super consistent for what we think uh, normal type 2 supernovae come from. Another feature that we often see in, uh, in supernovae is circumstellar interaction. And this is when the supernova, either through photoionization or interaction from the ejector, hits uh, a hydrogen-rich circumstellar medium, and this uh, spectroscopically uh, manifests itself in narrow uh, superimpositions on, uh, for example, this is H-alpha. Uh, so this defines the type of supernova that I usually work on, the type 2N supernovae, uh, and uh, type 2 n supernovae have super long-lasting CSM interaction, but in some cases of regular type 2 supernovae, you have fleeting uh, circumstellar medium interaction, which lasts of order a week. Uh, and on, on the right here is the early time spectrum from uh, Wynne, Jacobs and uh, Galan et al. And you can see, uh, the, uh, this is the H-alpha line again. Um, you can see the early spectrum has this, I call it the Eiffel Tower shape, uh, 
interaction signatures and then after about a week it sort of dies off and then you get the broader lines that you associate with supernova ejector. Uh, so where did this circumstellar medium come from? Um, maybe there was some eruption or could it uh, there just be some steady state wind? Um, one option is uh, that, we, that we, there was some uh, outburst. Now, was this outburst uh, observable? In some, uh, in intact to end supernova, again, uh, this is fairly common, uh, being seen in roughly a third of the ZTF sample. Um, but you, we also see this in more standard type 2 supernovae. Uh, this is an example, um, 2020 TLF. Uh, these are light curves here. The, the filled in squares are not limits, they are uh, real detections showing uh, some activity before the supernova. Um, IXF is really close. There should be a lot of data. Uh, it's an excellent case study into the pre-supernova activity. So through the Young Supernova experiment, which uses pan stars, uh, we, ha we have gone through and found uh, around 5,000 days of, uh, of, of data pre-explosion in uh, the G, W, I, R, Z and Y filters. The W filter we don't use in light curves because it doesn't have any colour information though, uh, just in case you wonder why it's not in any plot. Um, to obtain deeper limits uh, on uh, the supernova location in uh, this pre-explosion data, we actually use a, an idealised source injection method. And this is where we match uh, the, the red circle on this cutout here is where the supernova is. And these green circles are match locations with similar pixel distributions. The idea being that um, any correlated noise should be roughly similar here. So in the difference image, we have a more comparable uh, uh, force photometry regime. Um, so so we, 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 we put these uh, apertures down and then we inject a fake supernova. And this fake supernova may decrease in, uh, in its flux. And then we set a limit at, at 80%. So what this means is 80% of these apertures will still have a detection over the, three sig over the traditional three sigma limit. And, uh, and, and then this is our limit for that epoch. Um, there are already near-infrared detections. Uh, this is a dusty red supergiant progenitor. Uh, and, and this is our light curve. So we do not find any detections at the 80% limit. Uh, the horizontal dashed lines up here are, uh, are known pre-supernova outbursts from different objects. So from two ends, from LBV outbursts, and then uh, 2020 TLF, which is a was an ordinary uh, type two there. Uh, so in this light curve, we have all of the literature data at, at the time of writing the paper, that is. Um, and uh, there's plenty of Spitzer data, there's some HJK data there as well, which aren't limits. Uh, we also looked at a slightly less stringent um, cutoff with our source injection of 50%. And there are two possible detections, but when we have a look, um, at the actual images, it, they don't seem to be real. So we don't see any uh, particular sign of pre-supernova uh, activity just from the light curve itself. Uh, we also don't really see any variability. So th this is just to highlight uh, some variability that was seen in, in the infrared. So the pink and green plots, that, uh, uh, points there are the Spitzer uh, observations. Um, and you, you can maybe uh, trick your eyes into thinking that the sparse HJK points there are also variable. Um, but we don't see that in our optical pan, star, pan stars um, filters. So can, can we do anything better? Because the CSM must have come from somewhere. Uh, can, can we do better than just looking at this light curve? Yikes. Um, okay, so we use a 
multi-layer perceptron classifier trained on a physical outburst model, which was developed by one of the incoming grad students. Uh, we apply this, classif uh, this classifier to the real data and also uh, the, a bunch of model light curves to get deeper limits onto any outburst. Um, so the salient model parameters are the input luminosities and the ejected mass. Uh, and the limits that we get, we use another 80% uh, cut off here. It's pretty arbitrary, but it seems to work. Um, and we've, we put limits on the, any outburst at 50,000 uh, solar luminosities and any ejector mass as under 0.3 solar masses. These blue curves are um, some other outburst models. Uh, our, uh, our outburst model is more R-net based. These are um, more hydro sim based. Um, and we also include uh, dust in ours while other um, models haven't. Um, but our results are entirely consistent with the literature. We then uh, consolidate all of our progenitor uh, data um, from all, all, all of the literature and we, uh, we fit the, the SED um, using dusty models with, uh, with model Mark's spectra of red supergiants, and we find a fairly massive red supergiant of between 14 and 20 solar masses. Uh, I say fairly massive because this is, uh, it, it pokes on something called the red supergiant problem, which depending on who you uh, talk to isn't a problem. Um, but it's one of the, the most massive uh, progenitors of a regular type two that we've seen. And, and uh, this left plot, uh, this right plot here, is um, our uh, our progenitor compared with the rest of the uh, the literature, widely consistent with everyone else. And then uh, just a quick thing about the host. Uh, so this is my image. This is why I stole another image. Um, this doesn't look quite as good as the other one. Um, we find that in terms of the H alpha emission from some other archival data. Um, and a pixel statistics technique that the environment is entirely consistent with a normal type 2 supernova. Uh, so I'll just leave uh, with my conclusions and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, do you expect any echo from the environment? Because you say that there was uh, a medium surrounding the explosion, so you would expect some scattering back with an echo. Um, so th this medium uh, is very uh, confined to the progenitor, so it would have been swept up by the actual ejector. Not much beyond that. Uh, so, so there's environmental dust. Uh, whether there is enough, uh, whether there's dust there to create a, a light echo, uh, not sure yet. Okay, we haven't seen it. Not yet. Uh, any comments? Go ahead. Uh, so uh, in the HR diagram for the progenitor, it looked like the the star is nowhere close to the end of a stellar track. Okay. So yeah. The, we yeah. So um, the logic there is that towards the very end of uh, of life, uh, your stars might change uh, their spectral types uh, and sort of dot around the temperature area. So we only use the luminosity limits, which is what everyone else did as well. This is roughly like ten percent edit or something like that. Roughly. For the project. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's thank uh, Connors again. <laughs>
It's a mouthful, but it's iFi. I split my time between MIT and the Harvard Center for Astrophysics. This is a consortium that additionally includes Northeastern and Tufts. And uh, my office here is P310. I would love to chat with any of you in the audience. So please feel free to come by. I'm going to talk about a topic that you, I'm sure, have never heard about, the twilight years of massive stars. But I'm going to take a maybe slightly orthogonal direction to, to what uh, was already discussed by Connor. So I study massive stars and, uh, and their explosive deaths as supernovae. These stars begin their lives at a zero-age main sequence mass of around eight solar masses or above. And for a long time, it was believed that in the final years to centuries before these stars ended their lives, nothing was really happening that was observational. So there were changes in nuclear burning at the core, but these changes couldn't propagate their way upward to the outer envelope of, for example, these extended red supergiants. And so really you just see a star sitting there until the time of explosion, uh, the explosion happens, and then you track its evolution. That has turned out to be a very bad uh, assumption as evidenced by both direct precursor detections, as you can see here in Spitzer data, quasi potentially periodic variability in the years leading up to the star's explosion. What's really interesting here, the red and blue points are the multi-band data, multi-channel data from Spitzer for 2023 IXF, what Connor talked about, and the smaller uh, light points are the variability that we've seen from Betelgeuse. Everyone's asking, is, is Betelgeuse exploding? And compared to that, uh, 2023 IXF was really doing something that we had never seen before. Um, so we, we've directly detected this precursor emission. And in addition, we find evidence in the explosions themselves of the explosion material sweeping up surrounding what's called circumstellar material that has been placed there in the final years before the star blew up. And this is kind of the picture that we're looking at. The really nice thing about supernovae, they have been kind to us in our observations, because supernovae ejecta move on order of 100 times faster than the circumstellar material that was placed there in this precursor eruption. And what that means is, if you track the photometric variability of a star, or of, of a supernova, excuse me, for about a year, then potentially you can trace the last century of, of uh, a dying star's life. And in fact, in some cases, we do see supernovae showing ongoing interaction signatures for multiple years after we first detected them, suggesting that potentially this variability extends far earlier than we might have initially believed. These things are hard to find. Evidence of circumstellar interaction manifests in many different ways, as shown by this cartoon here on the left, depending on the density profile and the amount of material that has been shed off in the massive star's life. And this might seem a little cartoony. You can get secondary or tertiary peaks in the light curve of the subsequent explosion. But in fact, we do see this observationally. So on the right, you see the double peaked light curve in multiband data for 2022 IXF, showing significant evidence of circumstellar interaction. 2022 IXF was nicknamed the Bactrian after a, uh, a camel with very prominent uh, double humps. So the question is, how do we go look for these things if the light curves are so diverse? Our discovery rates are increasing, our data sets are expanding at an enormous rate, and we don't really know what we're looking for. And so we can ask two questions. One, does the supernova's host galaxy tend to host massive stellar populations? Is it actively star forming? Because these are the types of explosions where we'd expect to see this prominent circumstellar interaction. And two, does the light curve show prominent and unexpected variability beyond the typical energy sources that we know to be powering uh, different classes of supernovae? And to be begin to explore this framework, answering these two questions simultaneously, we can take a, a particular technique that is growing in popularity from computer science called contrastive learning. So all machine learning is heuristics, right? Contrastive learning is basically built up around the idea that if you embed a higher dimensional data set into a lower dimensional space, and you know in advance that you want certain pairs to be close together in that embedding space, 
you can write a very simple function that has, as, uh, as part of its input parameters, the distance between these lower dimensional embeddings. And when you minimize that function in training, you're basically saying, minimize the distance between these two, these two modalities. In this case, the supernova host galaxy and the supernova photometry. So in this case, the, the embedded vector of the, the host galaxy image is x. The embedded vector of the supernova light curve is y. And all we're doing in minimizing this loss function is aligning those modalities for a single object. And then there are some tuning parameters as well here because you have one aligned pair for each instance and the entire rest of the sample is a negative pair. And so there's some, there's some tweaking that happens to make sure it trains accurately um, across the full lifetime of your training sequence. And so the data set that we're beginning to explore through this framework was consolidated as part of a hackathon that IFA ran in January uh, in collaboration with some really phenomenal colleagues, one of whom is, is sitting in the back. Um, and it's data from the Zwicky Transient Facility Bright Transient Sample. This is over 5,000 supernovae that have been characterized in the northern hemisphere sky since 2018. We have associated host galaxies and their postage stamps here. We have multiband light curves from the same survey, and they're all spectroscopically confirmed. So we did this, this game. We worked on training a network to align the embeddings of the light curves in the host galaxies. And here's how we do. This is what's called a receiver operator characteristic curve. And all it's showing us is the validation in the case where I say, I've trained my system, my embedding network, and now I embed a given light curve, and I take some surrounding embedded galaxies. How many galaxies do I have to scoop up before I've caught the true host galaxy of that supernova? So the horizontal axis is the threshold, the fraction of the full sample that I have to scoop up, and the vertical axis is what fraction of the full sample do I get right? Do I find the true host galaxy? This is symmetric, so you can play the same game with the host galaxy and the associated light curve. And what's really interesting is that it's learning a signal. Here in the validation data set, we do better than random, this diagonal line, which tells us that truly it is learning some connection between the host galaxy images and the associated light curves. This is better than we would have expected. I mean, you, you expected core collapse explosion to happen in actively star-forming galaxies and type 1a supernovae to mainly prefer red and dead elliptical galaxies, but there's a lot of blurred lines between those, those categorizations. So the fact that it's able to pull out this really noisy signal is quite impressive. And once we've built up this joint embedding space, we can begin to do some, some similarity searches between either of the modalities that we've embedded. So on the top row, I'm showing a queried very bizarre galaxy and the two retrieved nearest neighbors in that embedding space. They, they all look pretty strange to my eye. And on the bottom, I've queried the light curve for the Bactrian, albeit a lower, uh, a lower resolution representation of the Bactrian. And the matches are okay. And what I think is really interesting here is that the matches that it recovers all seem to be fairly red and relatively long-lived, but we're not able to yet recover the smaller, the shorter duration variability as in the second peak of the Bactrian. Really what it's finding is supernovae for which hydrogen recombination dominates the light curve for about 100 days. These are called type 2p supernovae, and they're pretty red. And we're not yet able to find the really weird short duration variability that we would hope to in some of these much larger samples. So that's where we're going next. I mentioned that we also have spectroscopy for all of these sources. So you could imagine we play a game similar to the one we played before, where we align the light curves and the spectra of different types of supernovae. And this is what we've done here. This is the validation uh, ROC curve for the same kind of recovery game that we were playing in the previous slides. And as you might expect, photometry and spectroscopy are directly linked to the supernovae. You would expect those modalities to have a tighter connection. And indeed, in the training, you do see that you recover the right associated modality significantly um, more of the time than you do just using the host galaxy. And I think it's, it's interesting. It's early days for this work and for contrastive learning, but we can begin to explore some physically meaningful uh, validation questions 
for our learned latent space. In natural language processing, one that became very famous is you can embed the word king, you can embed uh, a man and woman as, as words, and when you do this vector arithmetic on the embedding space, king minus man plus woman equals queen, you end up with an embedding vector that looks very similar to your embedding vector for the word queen if you just did it naively. So this provides some intuition that it really is learning semantic meaning within the specific words. In our case, we explored this, a similar kind of question with multiple modalities. We took uh, a host galaxy of a core collapse supernovae, they're highly star forming, they're nearby, and we subtracted off the embedding vector for a core collapse supernova, and we added on the embedding vector for a very distant uh, superluminous supernova. These are, uh, come from compact galaxies. And we look, when we look for similar galaxies in the embedding space, what we see is maybe super luminous supernovae-like. Uh, I think this is really exciting, but again, it's early days, so uh, additional validation tests are needed to make this a little more rigorous. This is just one of the ways that we're exploring finding weird transients in petabytes of data, which will soon become very relevant for the Vera Rubin Observatory. And if you're interested in additionally exploring these questions with us, then next month we are running a hackathon to begin pushing on some of these anomaly detection techniques. Technically, registration has ended, but if you'd like to partic participate, please let me know. Uh, and uh, we are still looking for a room, so if you have a room for 30 people <laughs> during those dates, then uh, I'd love to chat with you as well. That's all I have. Thanks for your attention, and I'll take questions. <laughs> That's right, yeah, 2025. How do you expect to start applying your AI algorithms? It's a really good question. The hope is that, yes, we can apply these, in, these tools in real time as soon as the alert stream comes online. In practice, I think there's a lot of work that needs to happen in the next year to be able to get there, but that is the hope. So the data will be public immediately uh, as soon? The, uh, the data will not be public uh, immediately there are alerts that will be public and served through alert brokers. Uh, the data releases will come significantly later and will be proprietary for a particular period, but at least the value-added alerts we're, we're hoping to, to immediately serve to the community. Yeah. And that can activate themselves. That's right, that's right, exactly. Um, any comments, questions? Alisa? Um, if you go back to the, the flap where you said you wish that it looked a little bit more back that one. Oh, yeah. this one. Yep. Yep. So, do you have a way in this whole system to know how much, you know, how much training you should need, or how many, how big of a sample you should need before you can get that to match better? No. Darn. It's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned that a lot of machine learning is heuristics. Uh, this is going to be an iteration. We have a smaller labeled sample, and so we're trying to extract as much information as we can. There are a lot of design choices that we implemented in just how we're encoding the light curves, and so it's, it's certainly possible that a different architecture could better pull out shorter duration phenomena than we're able to uh, here. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? If not, uh, let's uh, Alex, and everyone.